Good evening, everybody. I want to call this school board meeting for Wednesday, August the 4th, 2021, to order. Ms. Bowers, would you please call the roll? Ms. Afanja? Here. Ms. Banks Gray? Here. Mr. Kilgore? Here. Dr. Mason? Here. Mr. Samuels? Present. Dr. Woodhouse? Here. Ms. Cherry? And let the record reflect that Ms. Cherry is absent. She had a prearranged trip prior to this um, meeting. At this time, we'll move to item number 1.02, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'll ask our student rep, Ms. Tamia Kelly, to lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is item 1.03, the adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded that we adopt the agenda. Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Ms. Afanja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, moving to section two, recognitions. I will now turn it over to Ms. Kelly Gore, who is the Executive Director for Public Relations for Hampton City Schools. Ms. Gore? Why, thank you, Vice Chair Mason members of our school board, Dr. Smith, and members of our Hampton City Schools family. Tonight, we have two guests joining us from our community to present special PTA recognitions. Our first guest is Ms. Pam Kroom, the president of the Virginia PTA. Ms. Kroom, would you please proceed to the podium? Ms. Kroom will be recognizing the Virginia PTA Volunteer of the Year as well as an additional nominee. Thank you so much. Good evening, Dr. Mason, Dr. Smith. It's so good to be home and members of the Hampton City School Board. Um, I really miss being here. <laughs> Thank you for allowing us to have this moment in time um, to recognize two uh, very special PTA members in our community. Um, if I can have Ms. Whitney Rosario and Mrs. Karen Herrett to join us. Both of these individuals, Mrs. Um, Rosario, was nominated for the Volunteer of the Year for the elementary school level. Ms. Karen Herrett was nominated as our secondary uh, Volunteer of the Year. Uh, these women um, advanced from the local level, which is at the Hampton Council level. They were named Volunteer of the Year at the district level for Peninsula Council, and I'm joined this evening as well by our district director, uh, Michael Willen, and our assistant district director, um, Bertha Thompson. And so it gives me great pleasure to say that we had a Hampton winner um, for our volunteer of the year across the state. We had uh, 10 representatives in the elementary school category and we had eight in our secondary category. And so with that, gives me great pleasure to announce that Mrs. Whitney Rosario was named the Volunteer of the Year for Virginia PTA and is our state representative in the elementary category. <laughs> it was a tough category um, in our secondary. Mrs. Herrett has done an outstanding job in everything she's ever done. Um, we we're very fortunate to have her. Um, so although she was not selected as our state winner, it doesn't take away a thing that she has done in this community and continues to do in this community every day. And we do appreciate her. Uh, Rosario, I mean, what can we say? Um, volunteer of the Year is not about the amount of volunteer hours that are put in. It really is about the mission and the values of Virginia PTA or the PTA um, as, as an organization. And Mrs. Rosario's 
um, application and the support documentation that came along um, with her um, application just show that she really treasured um, and valued that mission and that she really enjoys the work that she does at Barron Elementary. So I should mention that she is representing Barron Elementary. Um, and she has a lot of support. We have put it out several times and every time that school community floods Facebook with their congratulations and, um, and their well-deserved um, messages for Mrs. Rosario. So thank you so much for all that you do for PTA. And so. I don't know if I've ever stood at this podium. It's so a uh, great perspective. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at, at all my favorite people. So nice to be here tonight, and I thank you so much for indulging me and giving me this opportunity to, um, to make a couple of presentations on behalf of the Virginia House of Delegates. Um, and, you know, uh, I, as she said, I was, uh, was a school board member, so I was like, she's taking the notebook away. You know, I had all the, all the cheat sheet notes on there. But I'm so pleased to be here. Good evening, uh, Vice Chair Mason and Dr. Smith and members of the board. Uh, thank you again for, for allowing me to join you tonight. Um, it is my distinct honor to present two House resolutions on behalf of the General Assembly today, and, uh, or tonight. Um, I'm usually talking in the daytime. Um, so I'd like first to call up, if you would, uh, Mrs. Croom, Pamela Croom, if you would come back up, um, because, um, you know, with the pandemic, there have been so many things that have been going on that we haven't been able to acknowledge and recognize, but um, I want to just um, acknowledge uh, Mrs. Pamela Croom for her current position as the president of our Virginia PTA. Uh, very, very distinguished honor for uh, someone from our fair city to be uh, serving in that role. And um, so if you will indulge me to just share with you the content of this resolution, I will try and be, um, try and read it quickly. Um, but I do want to make sure that we acknowledge her appropriately. Whereas Pamela Brandon Croom of Hampton was elected the first African American president of the Virginia Congress of Parents Teachers Association, a nonprofit advocacy association that supports students throughout our Commonwealth. And whereas the Virginia Congress of Parents Teachers Association's Virginia PTA was chartered in 1921, that's a really great year my mother was born in 1921, <laughs> and has become one of the largest such organizations in this country, uh, serving hundreds of thousands of members in more than 1,200 local organizations. And whereas Pamela Croom, a business and workforce development manager for the city of Portsmouth, joined the Parent Teacher Association at her daughter's school more than 30 years ago and has provided her valuable expertise to organizations at the local, regional, and state levels. And whereas president of the Virginia PTA, Pamela Croom will work with teachers, administrators, students, family members, businesses, community leaders, and government officials, like myself, to ensure that young people have the tools to achieve success in and out of the classroom. And whereas Pamela Croom has promoted a vital role in that parents play in their children's education and strives to keep families engaged in the learning process. And whereas Pamela Croom plans to increase equity and diversity among membership in the Virginia PTA, as well as create new opportunities 
for leadership and professional development. And whereas Pamela Kroom has been formally installed as president of the Virginia PTA annual meeting in March of 2021, which will commemorate the organization's 100th anniversary. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Virginia House of Delegates, that Pamela Kroom hereby is commended on becoming the first African-American president of the Virginia Congress of PTA, Parents and Teachers Association and be it further resolved that the clerk of the House of Delegates prepare a copy of this resolution, which I have in my hand, to Pamela Brandon Kroom as an expression of the House of Delegates affirmation of your great service and historic achievement. Present that to you. Good job. Congratulations and thank you so much for your service to the Commonwealth. As you all know, um, Mrs. Kroom has served as um, the president of the Hampton Council PTA and provided service to the Hampton community. Um, and she re has received two Virginia Lifetime Honorary Memberships. Sorry, I forgot I had that on. Um, that shows how acclimated we all are to that. Um, and um, she's also been awarded uh, many numerous awards from Hampton City Schools. So I also would like to take this opportunity to present a resolution that I presented virtually last year on, um, uh, on in July, I believe it was, um, to Dr. Jeffrey Smith. And um, it is my, my honor to present this resolution tonight in person. Uh, this is really one of the first opportunities publicly that I've had to, uh, to join you all as, as a board and to have the opportunity to bestow this resolution on Dr. Smith. As you all know, um, he was, um, he was uh, honored in a number of ways in 2019 and 2020, first as the Virginia Superintendent of Schools and then was a finalist and the nominee from Virginia uh, as a national superintendent of the year. And so um, I don't wanna read through the entire resolution again because it is in your records, but I did wanna take this moment if I may approach the, the superintendent and present him with this resolution. And so I will just close by saying that we are lucky and honored to have you serving us in the city of Hampton and lucky and honored I am to have you serving in the 91st district. The Commonwealth is grateful for your service to our young people and we are grateful for your service to the entire country for your sharing of your knowledge and uh, you're always willing to share your process driven approach to education with anyone who will listen. <laughs> but many, many educational leaders have benefited from your wisdom and your willingness to share your, your knowledge and your experience. And we are thankful to you for that. And, and you really bring great honor to the Commonwealth. And uh, as someone who is respected here regionally, who is, is respected in our Commonwealth and respected all across the United States. So thank you, Dr. Smith, for your service. Thank you, Mrs. Mugler. And uh, Dr. Mason, that concludes our recognitions for this evening. All right. Thank you very much. And it's uh, congratulations to, to the honorees that were uh, presented tonight. And Dr. Smith, congratulations thank you. to you as well. It's always Thanks, good Jim. to see uh, Ms. Mugler, Delegate Mugler. And I see we have Councilman Chris Bowman with us tonight too, so thank you for being here, Councilman. So moving along, we are at item number three, the consent agenda, that's 3.01, personnel report 21-14, and 3.02, minutes of the school board meeting of July 7th, 2021. Is there a motion to accept those as a block? So moved. Second. 
All right, it's been properly moved and second that we accept items 3.01 and 3.02 under the consent agenda as a block. Ms. Bowers, will you please call for the vote? Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Afonja? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, moving along to item number four, superintendent and staff reports. And at this time, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Smith. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, Dr. Mason, and uh, good evening to everyone. It's my pleasure at this time to begin the superintendent and staff reports with our 2021-2022 instructional and mitigation plan. I would ask that uh, Dr. Cajano, our deputy superintendent for curriculum instruction and assessment, come to the podium. He will begin the presentation and then be followed by Nurse Glory Gill um, and also then followed by uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Bowling. Uh, as you know, Nurse Gill uh, serves as our director of health services and certainly Dr. Bowling, our chief of operations. And so uh, we'll begin the presentation with uh, uh, Dr. Cajano, our deputy superintendent. Good evening, uh, Vice Chair Mason, members of the board, Dr. Smith. My pleasure to be with you all this evening. The purpose of this presentation is to provide the board with an update regarding the division's 2021-2022 instruction as well as health mitigation plan. As Dr. Smith mentioned, kind of threefold for our agenda this evening, I'll spend some time on the instruction plan. Nurse Gill uh, will follow with some health mitigation strategies and then Dr. Bowling will wrap us up with a, an overview update regarding cleaning protocols and personal protective equipment. Much like the beginning and planning efforts associated with the 2020-21 school year, uh, the division's planning team coming before the board with really uh, several phases of school operation to begin the school year. And so as you can see here, phase one, two, three, I'll spend some time briefly going through each phase. We'll highlight the division's updated website as of this evening where uh, community members and those watching can find some additional information. And as you can see, we are recommending start phase two for the coming school year. So phase one accounts for student learning in either an in-person or virtual learning environment based on student selection made during the spring of 2021. So as the board will recall, on May 19th, we came before the board really to share our intentions about our instructional model for the coming school year. Uh, during that meeting, uh, we provided information in reference to in-person, which was our intent to move forward with a Monday through Friday traditional bell schedule. Uh, we talked about in-person learning and making a bit of a shift. Uh, the, uh, the arm of the Virginia Department of Education called Virtual Virginia is offering virtual learning this year to students throughout the Commonwealth. And so on the 19th, we presented that information to the board. That evening, we shared information via social media, updated our website, emailed parents as well. Uh, the 20th, we continued kind of a marketing blitz through uh, Ms. Gorrell's office, updating social media posts and whatnot. On the 23rd of May, that Sunday evening, parents received a call from us, uh, again, sharing that intent where we were looking to move for the coming school year. We also shared information regarding student vaccination clinics at the time. And then on the 26th, we had an informational session for parents. We held that via Zoom. Uh, we had several hundred parents show up. We, re we recorded that, posted that to the division's website as well. So. And when we take a look at phase one, uh, masks are optional for fully vaccinated students and staff in secondary schools. Masks are required for students and staff in elementary schools and combined schools. And so in this particular phase, we know at this time a vaccine is not yet available for children under the age of 12. And so hence the, the recommendations you see before you. For phase two, accounts for student learning again in person or virtual, same as what I just shared a minute ago. Uh, in this case, however, uh, based on CDC, VDH guidance, Virginia Department of Health, masks are required for all students and staff for in-person learning. For phase three, if the metrics dictate that we move to a more restrictive setting, 100% virtual for all students, we would be prepared to do so, and that would be all students moving to a, an all-virtual environment. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper and talk about some of the processes associated with these uh, prior to near school coming forward. So if we break down phase one just a little bit further, uh, elementary students, again, and students who were schools with we've uh, combined grades like a pre-K through eight or at Spratly with grades three through eight. That traditional bell schedule, we're gonna maintain physical distancing of at least three feet to the greatest extent possible. Nurse Gill will talk a little bit more about that and some of the mitigation strategies associated with it. And again, students and staff required to wear masks. Phase one for secondary students returning to in-person learning. 
uh, maintain that traditional bell schedule Monday through Friday. Again, uh, wearing a mask would be optional uh, for fully vaccinated students and staff. And of course, the online uh, virtual uh, learning option there for, for virtual Virginia. I want to remind the board back on the 19th, we also shared in reference to virtual learning that we set an internal deadline for our parents of June 4th. And so the actual deadline for virtual Virginia was July 15th. And uh, we wanted to ensure, as we shared with the board at the time, that anyone and everyone who wanted a slot, we would be able to secure that slot. And so pleased to say this evening that anyone who submitted a form by June 4th, we were able to register and reserve a slot for virtual Virginia. Now, what we also did was we had calls, of course, coming in after that June 4th. And so we registered students all the way up through July 15th when that window closed, which was out of our hands. And so again, please report all of those students were able to be enrolled as well. And I'll talk a little bit about in a minute how in the most uh, recent week since July 15th, how we've had some requests both directions, some wanting to move from virtual to in-person and vice versa. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Phase two, where we're recommended again, at least three feet of distancing for in-person learning to the greatest extent possible. Masks would be required for all students and staff. Right. Right. And again, virtual learning yeah. uh, through the <coughs> virtual Virginia program is the online option. If by chance we had to start or had to move to a more restrictive setting with all virtual, if we begin the school year in person, you would remain with your roster teachers. And so we would, again, move to, and we're well equipped to do that, move to an all virtual setting. You would keep your roster teachers, no transition there. We would ask, and we've asked parents, that uh, if you're virtual Virginia, you would remain with virtual Virginia. And part of the reason for that is there are two different academic calendars, as we've shared with the board. On August 24th, Virtual Virginia actually starts, concludes on May 27th, and of course, in Hampton, we are a post-Labor Day start. So that's one piece of information. When you look at the, uh, the, the virtual uh, learning opportunity for, for students, well, let me talk about uh, the, the requests and, and changes. Um, so if I am currently signed up for virtual, and I've made a decision, the family's looking to move to in-person. The guidance we've received from the state is that, that divisions are to honor that request. And so, so what they've left up to localities is the process. And so what we've shared with principals this week, and we have this on our website, if I'm a parent who signed up for virtual, we've been, you've been confirmed as virtual, and you now want to move to in-person either before the school year or, or while the school year has started, you fill out the form, we work for the school, we kind of unenroll you through Virtual Virginia, you're enrolled in our program. What we're asking parents in that case is that we transition at the end of the quarter. What we've shared with principals, there may be some extenuating circumstances, we would certainly work with families, but we would ask that transition to occur at the end of the quarter. Uh, right now, we have some families who are looking to, they didn't sign up for virtual, but now they want to move in that direction. And so, um, as of this morning, we have a wait list for that, and that is uh, 22 students on our wait list. And the process for that is, is you have students currently moving throughout the Commonwealth from virtual to in-person, so it's opening up some slots, right? And so what's happening is we receive email updates throughout the week from Virtual Virginia. They say, hey, on Tuesday, we're gonna open the window from 12 to 1.30. What we're doing is we've got staff at computers at 12 o'clock, and as soon as it hits 12, we're logging on and getting students on board. So uh, we're trying to work with families as much as possible. Again, our model, both in-person and to accommodate requests in-person, and, uh, and virtual. On our website this evening at five o'clock, this went live. And so where you see the arrow pointed, this is the homepage of our website. Uh, Ms. Girl's office, we've updated down there the 2021-2022 Instruction and Health Mitigation Plan. Plan. When you click on that icon, it takes you to this page here. So lots of information, it's a little bit difficult to see on the screen, but information in reference to virtual learning, health mitigation strategies. I love what you hear Nurse Gill and Dr. Bowling talk about this evening all available for parents on that uh, on that website here so at this time i'll ask uh, nurse guild to come forward and as she's coming forward i did want to share in reference to virtual learning that the state recognizes uh, military families moving into the state they recognize transfers from division to division so they have set aside some slots for those families as well and we continue to work with those families uh, closely who are requesting uh, that particular learning model mm -hmm. nurse Gill. good evening Alrighty, we have presently um, developed a HCS 2021-2022 health mitigation strategies. Those strategies are available through that link. Um, I want to say that through the correspondence and guidelines from the VDH, VDOE, 
um, CDC and even Ac the Academy of Pediatrics. Um, we have tried to develop a comprehensive plan that encompasses both infectious disease as well as what's appropriate and, and, and um, geared to children and getting them back into school, which is our goal ultimately is to get our children back into school and to provide them that excellent learning environment that they ha can have. So uh, based on all of that, with those guidelines, that's what we have in our health mitigation strategies. Guidelines to be, these guidelines will be reevaluated no later than the end of the first quarter. That gives us plenty of time to gain the guidance from CDC, VDH, at, which does tend to almost, sometimes it feels like on a daily basis, fluctuate and change. So we are monitoring that at all times. Um, CDC also recommends universal indoor masking at this time, and that's where this change has occurred, um, regardless of vaccination status. And so that's what we're uh, striving to do at this point in giving you guidance as well as uh, where that guidance was came from. Um, so the mask requirements for all students and staff, they must wear the face covering. Um, students requesting a medical waiver for classrooms or bus riding should consult with the school administration. Um, there is uh, some flexibility in the classroom, but what is not flexible at this time is uh, for bus riding because it's a federal law that they re are required to wear a mask. And so um, we have honored those uh, waivers that were given uh, last year. That will continue. They don't have to go back and do that again. It's for any new students coming in will need that waiver. When a student is not able to wear a mask, we ask for additional strategies that they utilize, which is face shields, um, some distancing, uh, as well as uh, we have other things I'll discuss in a little bit. All right, in re re relation to spacing and distancing, CDC recommends a three feet of distance to the greatest extent possible. Um, when three feet of distance is not possible, all, all other mitigation strategies should be implemented. And what I'd like to say about this is one thing that CDC consistently um, gives in their guidelines. You can give up one, you know, in all your mitigation strategies, you can relax on one, but then the rest of them should stay in place. You should not give them all up at the same time. So what we've chosen to do is looked at the three feet distance and trying to get as many students as we can safely in our buildings and health and keep it healthy. And so that's what we looked at. So we will continue with the additional mitigation strategies, some of which we will talk here, but also as I further go on to this presentation. We will continue to use the um, desk shields. Um, Dr. Bowling will discuss that he's purchased even more uh, for that, as well as the shields in the offices. So we have barriers so that when you do come to visit, our staff are not uh, potentially exposed to someone who may have COVID. We continue to utilize um, a scheduled use of the bathrooms because we don't want too many kids in there and sharing that. Because um, we love, you know, at this point, we want to be social. We want to be together. We want to have conversation. And so we've got to monitor how they're going to go all doing that. Uh, the use of the playground. One of the things that um, in talking with my liaison with, with VDH, as well as uh, looking at the data for, or information from CDC, is we can now be outside, masks off, which is going to be phenomenal for the kids just getting that energy that they need to get out and play in the, the playground. Um, use of the playground equipment is permissible. Uh, we don't have to, with every use, spray it down, and so that is a good thing that we're progressing that way. Um, if activities result in students being closer than that three feet, then we do recommend the uh, mask because obviously they're too close. You have the droplets from talking and, and things like that, so you want them to have that protection. All righty, the distance of at least three feet between students during um, lunch, and this is an area that we are continuing to look at and, and improve on. Consid we're using, uh, considering, excuse me, we're gonna continue to use the desk shields um, if spacing represents a challenge and consider non-cafeteria spaces for lunch. We're also looking at uh, continuing what we had last year in having the lunches, breakfasts and lunches in the classrooms. So they have their desk shields, they have the spaces that they need, so that works really well. Um, one of the biggest things that, that I'd like to stress, but uh, it has been stressed throughout last year as well, is that, that building of that culture that we are here together and we have to um, work to stay healthy and well. 
And so to do that, that means that we all are aware of the health mitigation strategies that we have, that we implement them uniformly throughout all of our buildings, that our teachers reinforce that in every turn that they have, and that parents are part of that team in making sure that kids don't come to school when they're ill, that staff don't come to school when they're ill, and that we do all those things as a team. Um, so that's very important. So that culture that's there, I think, has started last year, but it will continue, I think, even greater this year. We will continue to use the health questionnaire that we used previously, um, that the teachers and staff, as well as the parents, need to review before they come to school. What that does is say, okay, if you have any of these symptoms or you've been exposed to somebody who has COVID or has COVID-like symptoms, please stay home contact the school administrator and the school nurse and we can determine if that's necessary that you stay home but at least have some uh, protection from coming into school and then actually exposing others to that that did work very well in pre in last year our numbers were significantly less in, if you compare to other school districts and so I believe that that's because of the all of the med health medication strategies we've done but also with our parents and our staff uh, following that health questionnaire process we're gonna continue with the health screening by teachers each morning, which is a poster I'll show in a second. And that just goes through all of the basic symptoms. Um, sometimes kids uh, may not even tell their parents they don't feel well, but all of a sudden then you present with them what it is and they go, oh, well, I do have a headache or I do have this. Now we will have students that may want to come down to see the nurse um, just because they're not they want to come down and see the nurse. So obviously we'll get some in the beginning that just training them up and making them aware with the symptoms. But students with symptoms will be sent down to the nurse. It worked very well last year. I am sure that it will continue to work this year um, as well. Adhere to confidentiality and personal responsibility. One of the things that is very important is that we ensure one, um, that it just because a student comes down to the clinic doesn't mean that they have COVID. Or just because the parent says, I'm keeping the child home, our bus driver doesn't think, oh, they have COVID and they start talking about it. So uh, I'm having uh, briefings with the bus drivers as well. It's just to talk about that we just don't assume and don't share. And so we'll continue doing that, obviously. And then personal responsibility. Again, I talk about the team and the importance of being that culture of health and wellness, and this is, this is where that is. We also will continue with our health uh, visitor health questionnaire. It's posted on the front of each of the uh, buildings where they have to press to come into there. They'll be asked, did you review that? Um, and in many of the clinics, they'll also have the temporal scanners to uh, check the, the student as well as the uh, visitor if they're having to, staying in the building itself. These are the two posters that we used last year and will continue to use this year. Um, the one on the left is for uh, elementary students and the one on the right is for middle school and high school. And you'll see it pretty much covers the basic symptoms of the COVID. All right, our other additional mitigation strategies uh, we are talking about limiting sharing of the supplies and manipulatives, especially when you talk about pre-K through about second grade, because they do tend to put their hands in their mouth, in their nose, and other places. So we try to make sure that we're keeping that hygienic as much as we can. Um, but in general, we, the data does not show that a lot of the trans transferring of the, the virus is through actual objects. It's more the respiratory and talking with each other. And so that's why we've relaxed that a little bit more. Again, not giving up everything, not turning everything up into we can do anything, but just slowly relaxing those things that we can based on data, not based on our preferences. Continue hand hygiene, that is the number one thing for killing germs, um, as well as respiratory etiquette. Uh, we teach that all the time, but we're gonna continue to keep teach that during this time. Uh, then wiping down of desks and areas, especially when they're soiled or whatever. No significant, like I said, no significant transmission of COVID on surfaces except if active coughing. And so obviously you got uh, students that are coughing, we, they're gonna come down to the nurse to see, it could be asthma, it could be allergies, it isn't necessarily COVID, so we'll check them out. And we don't just listen to, you know, say, oh, you, you know, what kind of cough do you have? We have a pulse oximeter, we have our listening to the lungs, we don't just do one little thing, we do a full assessment. 
Staff may uh, congregate in break rooms, but should still keep the distance. One of the things CDC does say is that for adults, because we do are we are one of the bigger transmission of the virus, is that uh, keep your distance as much as possible. If they're not eating, have their masks on. Doesn't mean that they can't get together and 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 work on things together, but they just need to keep that distance. Um, the other thing that we do use is the air purifier. They're in all, every single classroom and in most offices, and so that's the additional measure that the CDC talks about for good ventilation and air purification. The distance of at least three feet will occur during meetings as well, and so as we begin our process of coming back to school, the principals were and administrators were, just, we talked about that uh, Tuesday, and so they're aware of that as well. I don't know why I'm so nervous around you. I've seen you guys before. <laughs> <laughs> um, health mitigation strategies. Nurses will continue to implement contact tracing, and that's important because I think that that significantly decreased our numbers because parents were aware we were going to call about and ask them questions. The students were aware we were going to be asking them questions, and teachers were aware. Um, vaccination status to determine quarantine. Uh, we do occasionally get someone, who, a parent or staff member, well, why are you asking me about my vaccination status? From a quarantine standpoint, if you have been already vaccinated, I don't have to quarantine you. I can say, okay, if, you're, if you develop symptoms, let me know, because then we do need to quarantine you. But otherwise, you're not needing to quarantine at this point. And so that's important. Then the same thing will occur with our middle schoolers and the high schoolers. They may not have to be quarantined. I also think about our sports related. If you have a whole team that's been vaccinated, that significantly changes things because they've already been vaccinated, so we won't have to worry quite as much. We still have to go through the contact tracing. We still have to talk about the symptoms, but it's definitely less. We will continue the use of the care room, which was where our COVID students, the students with possible COVID, uh, were stationed as, uh, in the building in, the, in our clinics. Uh, we will be in, it's important to take daily attendance so we know actually who was in there so when we do our contact tracing we have that as available as well and then we do promote vaccination it is not mandated but we do promote it um, and as uh, I'll show you a second the numbers as of July 31st in the United States 49.4 percent of adults were vaccinated with both fully vaccinated the city of Hampton, we were 49.4% of adults as well that were vaccinated. What I don't have the numbers on is those who have actually had um, COVID and so their immune system is already starting to improve in the sense of being exposed to it. So uh, Ms. Cherry usually is the one who asked me about the herd immunity and things like that. I can't give her that data, but it, we're progressing at least. Um, students, at least one dose that's been received, 12 to 15 year old, 29.8, and 16 to 7, not 39.1. So we're, you know, it's not bad, it's improving. Um, fully vaccinated, 12 to 15 years old, 21.5, and 16 to 17, 29.9. What I will stress here, because I know that the public does, does listen to this, is, is that it's really important. You got your first vaccine get your second vaccine. And, and even in talking with adults, yes, you feel terrible. Go still go get that vaccine. Your body is saying to you that it's building those immunities. It's building its what it needs to, but go get that second dose. And then COVID, I, d I did want to share a little bit of data related to, because we it's in the news, it's overwhelming some of us with the numbers that are there, but breakthrough cases of those that have already been vaccinated. It's a little scary when you say, okay, everybody should be vaccinated, and now we're going backwards, it almost feels like. From a data standpoint only, fully vaccinated that had breakthrough issues was 0.004%. That is significantly low. Those who, that occurred, um, that did, did occur to were 65 and older. So some of you up here are close to where my age is, we have to be aware of that. If you have multiple medical issues, that's more important. If you start having symptoms and you've had your shot, don't assume, okay, well, it's not related to that. Um, I should still go get checked out, okay? So that's, that, that's important. And we don't like to talk about deaths, but deaths do occur, and in the fully vaccinated, it has been 0.001% of those people. So it's, it, from a number standpoint and from a data standpoint, that's important to stress here, that we are making progress 
and that if you've been vaccinated, you have a lesser chance of having complications or respiratory issues and those kind of things. But it does happen. The data is there. Not all, I want to stress also that not all people can be vaccinated. We have people who have some medical issues that the vaccine would complicate even more. Um, there are other reasons that, stu that people cannot, uh, adults and children, cannot get the vaccine. So in your um, talking with people, we need to be mindful of the fact that not everyone has the opportunity to do that and, and stresses them because they don't want people thinking they don't care. They do care. They do care about their health. Uh, vaccinated seek testing if symptoms, um, and that's where I was stressing. If you do start feeling some symptoms and you've already gotten your two vaccines, it's important to go get checked just to make sure that you're not having, you're not one of those that can have the breakthrough. Um, COVID symptoms, positive cases. Uh, one of the things for Hampton City Schools previous to this, we did have, uh, and Robin Ruth could probably have the exact what was covered under it, but basically we don't have any more the coverage of if it's been COVID related and their uh, sick leave. Now they will take sick leave for their for the staff to, if they're if they have COVID or if they have to be quarantined. Um, we will continue with the COVID dashboard on our HCS website. We will start it again as school starts, um, so you'll see new it basically go blank and we'll start again. Um, Positive case communication will continue with the principal and the chief of elementary and secondary school leadership. We, we did that all last year. We'll continue this year. And just a just small discussion about the variants. Delta variant is more contagious than the other variants, and now we are up to Lambda as well, coming from Columbia. There are always going to be variants. The, the virus wants to do that. And so no di it is different, but no different than when you have the flu vaccine, and you get the vaccine, and then we have additional variants to that. And you get the flu, and you think, but I, then I shouldn't get the flu shot anymore. Yes, you should, but it does. you're not going to get it as bad as you would if you had, hadn't gotten the vaccine in the first place. COVID numbers have been rising in recent weeks, but hospitalizations related to COVID remain low. And that's important because people are not having to be hospitalized for the, the symptoms. And we're getting better at how to medicate them for it once they do have symptoms, which is very important. This is a uh, chart, if you will, from Peninsula Health District. We get it weekly and it shows the, this, the increasing that we're having. Um, we do show that on our database as well, our, our dashboard as well. Um, so we are getting those peaks. Uh, one of the things that I say sort of shows in this as well is what are we all doing now? I went on leave last week, went to Florida, other people are taking vacations. So we're gonna have more exposure to people, but we're also, um, I think people are, because of the publicity of uh, these variants, oh, I might have a symptom, so I'm gonna go get checked. So there could be people walking around, you could be all sitting here and have COVID, but you're asymptomatic, you don't have any problems, you're ever doing everything fine, and then you get that little cough and you go, oh, I should go get checked, and you do. So we're gonna see some increase in as that as well, um, but we are traveling. We do have military traveling as well, so we've just, there's a lot of travel and, and vacations and things that we, we're a social group of people. Immunization, some of the new information coming out. And uh, so all students, whether they're in person or virtual learners, do will be required to have all of their vaccinations and the physicals that are required. Last year, we sort of waived that a bit because of the nature of trying to get appointments and everything. But right now, as I've been told by medical professionals and, and physician offices, they've got the appointments. You just need to make them because they do fill up very fast about now. Uh, the new immunizations that are required for this year are the hepatitis A's. You'll see that we a lot of our pre-K's, K's, and up to even fifth graders have already had those. A lot of them got them earlier, but now it's a mandatory requirement. Um, meningococcal used to be you saw it in college level students. We're now seeing it in seventh grade. You'll get your first dose and you'll get your booster at 12th grade. HPV doses, it used to be three doses, and that sort of limited people going to get those um, vaccination. Uh, so now it's now done two, two doses, and it's both girls and boys. It used to be girls primarily. And then the Tdap, which started last year, but we're continuing it, obviously, to, for seventh, seventh graders. Looking ahead, um, review of health mitigation plan no later than by the end of the first marking period. Just because we've put it out there doesn't mean that we're not going to keep looking at it and seeing where we can advance, um, hopefully sooner than later, but it truly is based on uh, the guidance that we get. 
updating of the website documents for families and updating of the school websites, as uh, Ms. Gorilla has already said, and we're continuing at the school level of updating those documents so that parents have the most current and, and uh, current information. And then information reviewed with all staff to create a community of health and wellness focus. Um, we started that on Tuesday with the administrators listening to this similar briefing, and then they'll go back and their nurses actually will give them the briefing during their pre-service days. I think I'm done. Yes, so thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Mason, members of the board, uh, Dr. Smith, and honored guests. My name is Dr. Bowling, and I serve as the Chief Operations Officer for Hampton City Schools. And I want to speak with you tonight about the vital role that operations and maintenance plays uh, in this whole process of protecting our schools in this health mitigation plan. Uh, first and foremost is the most obvious, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, as they say, and there's nothing more true in the time of a pandemic and making sure that our schools are clean, uh, well, clean, safe, and sanitized there for every, all of our occupants. Now, we've been hard at, I think we're going the wrong way there, we've been hard at work this summer uh, because our buildings never shut down. They're always busy. They're always utilized uh, for summer programs and by community members. We have 12-month uh, employees that are uh, in our buildings and our office buildings as well. Uh, so we have made sure uh, that we have our enhanced cleaning uh, protocols in place that we established last year so that anyone who is participating in these, in these events uh, is safe. And we're making sure that we're going in nightly and sanitizing these spaces so when they come in the next day, they have a clean and safe environment to go on. Um, also, this is the time that we clean top to bottom, stem to stern our schools, and we really get in, dive in, and clean our schools and prepare. Uh, and we're excited to prepare, prepare our schools for the return of students uh, and teachers. It's been a while. We want them back in the building there, so we want them looking good. Uh, so we are busy cleaning and waxing the floors. Uh, we clean desks and tables and chairs. Uh, we're dusting light fixtures, elevated surfaces, not just dusting, that just kicks it in the air. We're vacuuming it up, we're uh, washing it down, we're scrubbing and disinfecting as we go. We're shampooing our carpets, the wall-to-wall -wall carpets, sort of like you see here in the auditorium, and more importantly, uh, in your elementary school classrooms, where you have the little area activity rugs that the students sit on, we're making sure that we're uh, shampooing, cleaning, and sanitizing those rugs as well. Um, we also are cleaning our windows and windowsills, uh, disinfecting restrooms, locker rooms, uh, auditoriums, gymnasium, other large areas like cafeterias. Uh, there's no part of the building that we're not getting to to make sure it is fully clean uh, and sanitized for our students and uh, faculty and staff. Also, uh, we have scheduled for all of our cleaning to be done on August 16th there and that coincides with the return of all of our new employees and new teachers so we want them to have a good experience coming into our schools for the first time and they're greeted by a beautiful clean school and clean classroom and they can feel secure coming in that environment knowing it's clean and safe there also on august 16th in our schools since our custodians will be coming off their summer cleaning crews that are out there cleaning our schools uh, we will have fully staffed uh, day crews and night crews back in our schools uh, so they'll have the full day staff full uh, evening staff working full hours uh, from this point forward to the end of school there and uh, as soon as they hit the door they're going to be doing enhanced cleaning there, the same sort of protocols that we put in place last year. And just as a uh, quick reminder, uh, we can see them up here uh, on the overhead here, excuse me, on the um, board here, utilizing hospital grade disinfectants. Uh, we're making sure that we're doing that. These disinfectants will kill just about anything, bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, mold, it kills them all there. Uh, wiping down of frequent touch points. These are, you know, desks, surfaces, handrails, tables, making sure we're keeping those clean. Cleaning and sanitized nightly of student desks and tables. That is hard surfaces and soft surfaces alike there. Uh, spraying the entire school building nightly with our electrostatic sprayers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, also, uh, the second prong of attack for us, if you will, uh, is PPE. 
we need to make sure uh, that we have plenty of PPE in our building and is readily available for our staff when they need it. And we've worked very hard uh, this summer to make sure that all of our summer programs were fully stocked with all PPE that they needed in order to operate under the protocols that they were under. Uh, and we're also busy now uh, as well working to provide our schools with all of the needed stock to prepare for the return of uh, all the students and of course teacher and faculty. We're also working hard as well to make sure that transportation in all of our vehicles as well have the same PPEs available to them on the school buses, vans, and cars that are available in our schools. Um, we have endeavored and put together a very robust supply chain for our PPE. That's really where the, the rubber meets the road for us there. We have to have that supply chain. If that supply chain breaks, we have problems. So we have set up multiple, multiple, multiple vendors that are able to supply uh, us in the hub of maintenance and operations, sort of to act as a warehouse, to supply and store those PPEs. And when the schools contact us for those PPEs, we're right there ready uh, to deliver them that day to them as they're requested. So there will never be a time that schools won't be without whatever PPE that they're asking for. Um, we have worked very hard to supply PPE into our schools, and we've talked about this at previous meetings there. So our schools are well stocked right now. And what I would like to do is share with you the numbers up here, but it's very important to denote this, that this, the numbers I'm sharing with you are what is in our stock and supply in operations and maintenance. This does not reflect what is already in our schools. So if you add that together, the numbers explode exponentially beyond what you see here. So let's start with the first form of PPE, face coverings, cloth masks there. We have over 20,000 face masks uh, in our supply, which are cloth. We have disposable face masks for adult and children. We have 80,000 of those. Uh, we have additional supplies on the way. Uh, face shields, you heard Nurse Gill say uh, that some people can't wear the mask, so we provide the face shields. Uh, the schools already have some in their schools, and we have an additional 3,500 of those face shields. Uh, death shields, uh, we put out over 20,000 death shields, one for e more than one for every student that we have into the schools last year. We have an additional 500 in the warehouse uh, with a pretty substantial order. Uh, that's coming in to bolster that number. So if we get back into school and a elementary school person says, I wanna have a pull out reading session there, I'd like to have 10 or 15 more, we are able to provide those no questions. So we can expand that out to meet the need. Also plexiglass shields for the office, guidance areas, uh, high contact uh, points with the public and you, you've seen them all around businesses. Uh, we have provided those, uh, they're in the schools already and as you can see we have quite a few more uh, should the request come in. Our disinfecting supplies, uh, we have put spray bottles on all our, in all of our cars, vans, buses, classrooms, offices, all throughout the schools. Uh, and they are filled with the, the chemical bios that we use, a botanical uh, disinfectant that we've talked about, that food grade safe, it's very safe for children. Um, and we have an additional, plus whatever's out there in the school, an additional 3,500 of those bottles are ready to go out if we need those. Uh, containers of disinfecting wipes, those are the big buckets there. They have 500 wipes in each bucket. Um, they are all dispersed throughout the schools, on the school buses, everywhere. Um, we have 700 of those in reserve with another 500 uh, on order. Uh, Non-latex gloves, we have 3,000 boxes in the warehouse now, uh, plus everything that's already in the schools. Uh, BioS, botanical disinfectant, we have 1,500 gallons uh, in the warehouse with an additional 25 barrels on order that contain 55 gallons per barrel. Uh, all schools have a barrel within their school, so elementary schools, every school has its own barrel with a dispensing pump so they can use that and they're disinfecting uh, in the spray bottles or in the uh, electrostatic sprayers. Uh, they can use that uh, at their whim whenever they need that. Uh, middle schools typically have two barrels and high schools have as many as three or four at their disposal. 
uh, electrostatic uh, disinfecting machines. Every school is equipped with their own machines. Uh, elementary schools typically have a minimum of one. Uh, middle schools, it goes up by size. Middle schools typically have two to three. High schools have three to four. Um, but we have 150 of those machines uh, in our boxes, brand new, ready to go. So should a machine break down, it's absolutely no problem. They contact us. There's never a time a school will go without a disinfecting machine. We can immediately replace that and send it off for repair. Um, and if they should ask us for, we need another one to really get the job done, no problem. We've got that for you. Um, hand sanitizing stations. We have free hand uh, free standing hand sanitizing stations and also wall mounted hand sanitizing stations all through our schools. Uh, we have plenty of refills to, to last probably at least two years or more of use there. Uh, and we have an additional 200 locations with what we have that we could put up uh, should a principal or administrator or teacher or somebody request it there. Also in every classroom, office space, uh, even on the school buses, we have one gallon, gallon size uh, gel hand sanitizer with the pump that's there. So there are lots of them in the schools. And uh, we have an additional 1,500 containers uh, in our warehouse ready to go out. So as soon as they're used up, we've got another one for them. And last but not least, uh, our HEPA air purifiers there. Uh, we have those, uh, as you heard Nurse Gill say earlier, all throughout the schools. Uh, every classroom has one, larger classrooms have two. Depending on the size of the area, it depends on the number of air purifiers that are there. We have them in the offices. Um, we have an additional 500 air purifiers in reserve, so should one break down, um, it's not a problem. We can immediately replace that with a brand new one, and we bought high quality air purifiers that came with a three-year warranty so should it, it hadn't been a year so should it break down we can mail it back and get a brand new one to put it back in our inventory and the heart of an air purifier of course is its filter there and we have 3,700 filter HEPA air purifier filters uh, in our warehouse what does that mean that means we have enough excuse me air purifiers to last the next year and a half to two years so we're covered with that and with that, that concludes my portion of the presentation. And I'll ask Dr. Caggiano and Nurse Gill if you'd like to come up and we'll open it up for questions from the board. Board members, do you have any questions? Comments? Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, may I ask one yes. question? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much for the report. A uh, lot of information to digest, uh, but uh, you did mention about new students coming from other uh, divisions um, in the middle of one of the quarters or in the middle of the year, and whether they would have an opportunity to um, select in-person or virtual. Could you please explain how that would work for someone coming into this uh, division? Uh, in the middle of the uh, school year. Yes, Dr. Woodhouse, right now at the elementary level, we have 180 students signed up, middle school 97, and high school 105. So uh, the majority of our transfers, when you look at approximately 400 students who are requesting virtual versus you know, approximately 19,000 students on board. So we don't see a significant demand or request even for transfers. But uh, what Virtual Virginia has said for those transfers or for military, for military families coming in, that they are reserving some slots. And so we've had success with that the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, beyond the July 15th deadline. So no reason to believe that wouldn't occur uh, in those particular circumstances as students uh, would make that request. But again, overwhelming majority of our students are looking to make that decision to return to in-person learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any more? I just have one comment for Nurse Gill um, and during your presentation one other thing that I really appreciate you um, stated is that after the first quarter that you will continue to review uh, um, the mitigation plan and enhance and make changes as necessary as it relates to the guidelines from CDC, the Virginia Health Department and so forth. So I really appreciate that we're continuously looking at ways to improve what we currently have because I believe the plan that we have in place is 100 percent solid but there's always room for improvement and I'm glad that we will be revisiting that after the first quarter so thank you so much mm -hmm. 
I would say uh, thank you, Mr. Samuels, for reiterating that. That was on one of my slides as well, in addition to the health mitigation strategies and what it states down there at the bottom is by no later, by no later than the end of the first quarter. So mm -hmm. those phases there could be reevaluated sooner. Again, a lot of it depended upon uh, metrics, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Kajian. I didn't mean to exclude you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, thank, you for, uh, thank you for saving me. Thank you. <laughs> you set him up nicely <laughs> to respond. Any other questions or comments from board members? All right. We'll proceed with uh, phase two, and so that the board and certainly um, members of our uh, community would know that that's the direction that we're planning to move in, and that is uh, to open in phase two. So thank you so very much. We appreciate it. At this time, let's move to um, our elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds update, uh, ESSER funds, and um, delighted that uh, Ms. Dorch, our chief financial officer, will certainly provide the board with an overview of um, our ESSER funds in that update. Thank you. So within this presentation, we'll do a recap of the federal coronavirus relief funds. We'll look at our two latest funds, talk about our spending plan, the impact to the fund 16 reimbursable projects budget, and then we'll end the presentation with next steps and recommendations. So looking back at our chart from the May 5th school board meeting, you'll see that the first four items we talked about these at, on May 5th, and we talked about how they were planned to be used and how they have been used thus far. So really what I'll focus on are the two newest grants, which are notated on the slide. So starting off with the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations, or CRRSA Act, the state actually received funds from the federal government and it allowed them to provide additional funds to school divisions through a competitive grant process. And we actually went after this additional funding because it specifically focuses on unfinished learning and extended school year programs. So when looking at the CRRSA, ESSER II state set aside funds, we received $2.5 million to address unfinished learning and then an additional $50,000, which that was the max award for the extended school year grant for planning purposes. And these grant funds will be available through September 30th of 2023. Now there is a list of the allowable uses on this slide, but I'm gonna go right into the proposals that we submitted for this grant opportunity. So under the unfinished learning, we submitted a $2.5 million proposal to implement elementary literacy camps. And really the focus is really to integrate English and language arts with our visual and performing arts departments to provide not only a academic experience for our young people at the elementary grade, but also something that's fun and engaging as well. And this camp right now is planned to be at least two Saturdays of each quarter. Then looking at our extended school year planning grant, again, the max award for planning was $50,000. And we received this grant to plan a middle school extended learning program. So currently within Hampton City Schools, we have a high school extended learning program. And what this will allow us to do is to extend that program down to grades six through eight. And really what our focus will be on is our career exploration, making sure that our students fit the pro, uh, pro, excuse me, portrait of a Hampton graduate, and then also making sure we're strengthening those literacy and numeracy skills <coughs> in grades six through eight as well. So then as we move to, I like to call this our big funds. <laughs> this is actually the latest grant that we have received. It's the ESSER three, and this was authorized under the American Rescue Plan Act. And within this grant, we actually talked about this grant back in May 
this. So the slide that you see is actually the same slide from that presentation. So I really wanted to include it as a refresher um, for everyone. But we have uh, been allocated $54.8 million, and these grant funds run through September 30th of 2024. And there is a link to the allowable uses. It's a very extensive list, but that will take you to that list if you can review um, later. But also with ESSER three funds, it is the same uses as ESSER one and ESSER two that we previously discussed, but there are some new requirements for ESSER three. So within the federal grant requirements, we have to make sure we spend at least 20% on unfinished learning. We also have to make sure that we make our return to in-person learning plan public on our website. And that is something that Hampton City Schools, we have done prior to this requirement being in place. And as previously mentioned, in the, in the grant, there is a requirement to continue to review it, but that is already a part of what we're gonna do for our students. Equitable services, um, this is a set aside funds for private school. Under this grant, that is not a requirement because the federal grant process has a separate um, um, application for private schools. The school divisions cannot reduce per pupil funding or staff in high poverty schools. And BDOE is actually working on a tool the school divisions will have to complete to make sure this requirement is met. And we actually have a webinar tomorrow so that we know exactly what we need to do. But I can stand here and say that we did not reduce any funding within our Fund 50 operating budget because we have federal grant funds. And then the last major requirement is the actual spending plan for the ESSER 3 funds. So the federal grant guidelines do require us to create a collaborative plan that takes into account our stakeholders and our community. And we're also required to make sure that the public has the opportunity to provide comments which we have instructed, or better yet, invited our community to do so tonight as part of our public comment process. So before I jump into the actual plan, which is, I think is the good part, um, I'm just gonna share the systems approach that we utilize in order to develop this plan. So I call this the mini budget process. We always joke about you know, finally getting out of budget season, but then we say, you know what, we gotta do a mini one this time. But I think this really allowed us to make sure that we utilize the funds the best way possible for the students. So in May, I actually did a presentation um, to the Return to School Task Force. We released a survey to not only the task force, but to our community at large, to provide us with the feedback on how we should best utilize these funds. Within June, we sent out funding requests within the finance department to the division leadership team. We also provided them the survey results. That way they can provide the funding requests based on their collaboration with their departments and with the survey results from the community and stakeholders. In July, we held individual budget meetings with each DLT member to really talk through what the funding requests were and what they would take to make them. We also had an opportunity, Dr. Smith and I, to meet with City Manager Don Bunting and the Assistant City Manager, Brian DeProfio. And I would say that was a really um, great meeting because we had a chance to kind of share our initial you know, draft plan with them. And it really opened up you know, continued collaboration for us to look at how can we both leverage these funds, not only to help the students of Hampton City Schools, tonight is the presentation um, to the school board and to the community at large and again we did utilize our social media outlets to invite the community out for the public comment and then on September 1st and hopefully my goal is before September 1st we'll get the grant application submitted to be the only <coughs> so let's actually look at the plan for how we would like to spend the ESSER 3 funds so there's four major categories um, there are prevention and mitigation strategies, unfinished learning, 
social, emotional, academic, and mental health needs for students, and then the catch-all other uses of funds. And we'll go through each one of the categories. So starting with prevention and mitigation strategies, 47% or $25.9 million is allocated for this category. And what we notice in the grant application, well, application and allowable uses, it really allowed us to have the opportunity to leverage federal dollars to improve air quality, not only in our school buildings, but also on our buses as well. So you'll see that as part of this plan, we are recommending to replace 41 of our transportation um, buses with air conditioning. And then that will also allow us to then retrofit those buses with HEPA air filtration systems. We also are planning for HVAC and roof replacements. And then we also wrote in personal protective equipment to address any work-related accommodations that are approved through our human resource process. You will notice that you do not see masks hand sanitizer or those type items in this plan. And that is because we have planned for a replenishment in our ESSER II funds. So we didn't want to duplicate that request within this grant application. So we look at our next category, which is unfinished learning. We have 25% of the funding allocated, and that's about $13.5 million. And it's important to note that that, that is more than the 20% that is mandatory under the grant guidelines. Looking at the actual uses, it includes 22 classroom teachers. As part of the stakeholder survey results, one, um, one of the items that came up a lot was reducing class size and remediation. And that is something as a division leadership team, we already started discussions around. So we are um, planning to hire 22 additional classroom teachers and also six early reading initiative instructional assistants. Now we know that these funds will end September 30th of 2024, so we have already created a plan to make sure that we can absorb these positions through natural reoccurring vacancies and not just adding to our school operating fund. We also include additional remediation dollars and really to target um, our students with disabilities and our students um, who are English language learners um, external tutor tutoring services. So about 10,000 hours has been written into the grant with the external parties that will allow our families to be able to utilize this service as needed. The plan also includes student books, literacy kits, a middle school literacy camp, which this would mirror the elementary literacy camp. And then they'll also um, continue funding of our digital learning resources, for example, Literacy Pro and the expansion of our 21st century program into all of our remaining elementary, pre-K-8, and middle schools. And that's about 15 additional schools. And there is a link within the spending plan to have the list of those schools. Then moving on to other uses of funds, 17% or $9.3 million has been allocated in this category. And really when you look at the list, even though it's in the other category, all of these initiatives still support student learning. So the first is our Zoom license renewal. The next being our hard to staff position um, bonus. And this is part of a recruiting strategy to make sure that we recruit the best talent within our schools. And similar to that, also adding additional pay for substitutes, just to make sure that we can attract mainly teacher and nurse substitutes within our buildings as well. Then looking at a food service van and truck, this will support our after school and summer programs, and then also help us in promoting that healthy eating with all of our students across the division. Then looking at our five-day meal kit for virtual learners, um, we will have the opportunity to allow our virtual learners to go to their school to pick up their meals. But if they do not want to do that more than one, um, more, or multiple times during a week, we will have a five-day meal kit option for them. 
And then our Chromebook and teacher laptop replacement. Because we expanded our Chromebook program, we thought you know, this is our opportunity to make sure we have a replacement plan in place and get it funded. And then we also have indirect calls and then continue funding for our digital program technicians and our internet connectivity position as well. Then looking at the last category, it is the student academic and social, emotional, and mental health needs. Approximately 11% or $6 million has been allocated in this category. And we know that the pandemic has increased this need. So it is important, it's an important area. And we wanted to make sure that we were very strategic in how we address the needs of our students. So going through um, our list here, we have the communities and, communities and schools of Hampton Roads. And this is a program um, within our school where there is a case management type process to really help provide those students supports for those students as identified um, by the individual school. Um, the hiring of a restorative justice model consultant, we know that we really need to make sure that that is the basis of our student uh, rights and responsibilities handbook. So it's important that that is implemented with fidelity within the school division. Our critical incident stress management program for staff, and I don't want to steal um, Robin Roos, our executive director of Human Resources Thunder, so I will not go into too much detail there because I know information is forthcoming on that. Um, our social emo emotional screener and climate survey for both teachers and staff. Enrollment attendance specialist, and this is to make sure that we're locating all of the school age children within the city of Hampton. Our social work paid internship program, our early childhood student engagement specialist, student achievement assessment stipend, after school counseling sessions, and partnership with our local community service board. And that's really to make sure that we're providing the student supports that are needed and really utilizing these federal dollars to do that for our kids. So that is, in a nutshell, our spending plan. But of course, anytime we get additional funds, there is an impact to the budget. So within our fiscal year 2022 Fund 60 Reimbursable Projects Fund, our original budget that was approved by the school board was $53.5 million. With the addition of the state set aside funds under ESSER II and the ESSER III funds, we would need to revise that budget by an additional $57.3 million. So on the deliberation agenda tonight, there is a request and recommendation to approve the revised budget of $110.9 million for Fund 60 reimbursable projects. So next steps. So tonight, as I mentioned, we did invite the public out to provide comment on the ESSER three spending plan. It is included on the deliberation, the request for the approval of the revised budget for Fund 60. And then the last step in the budget development phase of the ESSER three grant application is the actual submission on September 1st. That concludes um, tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dorch. Any questions from board members or comments? Mr. Samuels? Um, thank you, um, Vice Chair uh, Mason. I just, um, since uh, John Eagle is um, among us, hey John, I just wanted to ask if there were any um, enhancement with our Hampton City School bandwidth since we've receiving these additional funds and also are we gonna continue um, with our student having that uh, MiFi um, device at home so they can have internet access. We'll have you come down, Mr. Eagle. Thank you. You know, I had to put him on the spot. But I know he has an answer for me, or for us, I should say. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, good evening, Mr. Samuels. Yes, um, we are constantly looking at our network. It's actually part of the strategic plan to monitor the bandwidth and make sure that we're always planning for the future. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I'm actually involved in, we've just been having conversations in the last couple of weeks, is a new opportunity that the federal government has offered through the E-rate fund 
uh, with what they call special construction. So we're looking at building our own fiber network between all of our schools. Um, it's a very long-term project, but we're in you know, the early phases of that discussion. As far as the internet access for families that are struggling to get internet access, yes, that program will be continuing. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay, any other questions? Ms. Afonja? No question, but I just wanted to state that I was, I was reading through the presentation, I was very excited about how the funds, the ESSER three funds were um, inclusive of our young people who have had quite a bit of learning loss due to the disabilities and low income and um, in English learners and foster care youth. And so I was really excited that our division all allocated even more than what was recommended by um, our state for that population and for learning loss in general. And so I'm really excited to see that and really excited to see how our young people who are following those categories progress as they return back to school. So it was a really good job. Thank you for the presentation and for that information. Any other questions or comments? Well, I just want to say it's, it's really good to see how the funds will continue to elevate the learning standards uh, with Hampton City Schools at the same time while decreasing that achievement gap, um, just in terms of how that is, has been set up. And also just to you know thank Congressman Scott, because he was really big in pushing this initiative uh, through Congress trying to get these funds. And so we're excited um, about this opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Dort. And as she indicated, um, a full report, comprehensive <coughs> spending plan, also as an attachment to um, uh, the board report this evening as well. Mm -hmm. At this time, um, Vice Chairman, we'll move to staffing update. Okay. And Ms. Robin Ruth, our Executive Director for Human Resources, will provide that this evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, it's August, so of course I'm here for a staffing update. Um, it's a little bit different this year. We do currently have 56 vacancies, which it, it sounds like a big number. I have come here with, with numbers about this size before, um, but I've always had confidence that we are going to fill all those positions. Um, this year, like I said, it's a little bit different. Our, our pool of candidates is shallow, and so we are currently working with ESS, our substitute provider, and with uh, principals and administrators to identify some creative staffing solutions. Um, right now, the vacancies are currently evenly split. We've got 28 elementary, 28 secondary. So it, it's pretty evenly split. Any questions? Questions from board members? May I ask a question? Uh, yes, sir, Dr. Woodhouse. Thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I wanted to ask this question. When do we start uh, recruiting our teachers? Um, is it in May or June? Oh, no, sir. We started recruiting teachers for the 2021-22 school year in September of 2020. I, it is a full-time year-round business we do not wait okay do, do we have a do we have um, many people that apply for positions here in Hampton or do we have more uh, positions than we have applicants currently we have more positions than we have applicants mm -hmm. that is not normally the case but currently we have more positions than applicants do we consider all of the applicants that apply or? We, we consider anyone that we can get a license for. for as a, for instance, and we, prob we do have more applications than we have positions that are open. We do not have enough viable candidates because you mm -hmm. do have to meet criteria in order to get a teaching license mm -hmm. and the criteria varies and it's it's pretty tough for some positions mm -hmm. uh, to find folks who meet the criteria and so yes we consider a hundred percent of every person you know everybody who applies we consider their application we only move forward those candidates that can realistically get a license 
because if they can't get a license, then we can't hire them to be a teacher of record. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Samuels. Thank you so much, Ms. Ruth. Uh, I always ask this question every year. So which area do we have the most needs? Well, math as always. <laughs> um, but this year we also have a large number of language arts vacancies. Which is unusual. Now I do think that we right. will fill more of those than say our math positions. We also are, um, have a serious need for CTE positions, business, health occupations, uh, tech ed. And those are a little bit tougher because a lot of our CTE teachers are career switchers, mm -hmm. and so they have great job experience that they can bring, but they don't necessarily have the education classes that they need, or the, the requirements are just, a, you know, yep. a little bit different. For instance, in order for me to teach a, a law class, I have to have actually a history degree. I have to be able to be endorsed in history and social studies. Mm -hmm. I don't have to have a history degree, but I have to meet the requirements for a history and social studies endorsement. So if we have a lawyer who's a candidate, we may or may not be able to hire them. So that's, with CTE, it just gets a little tricky. Great work experience, but not always the, the background that DOE is looking for. Any other board members? All right. Thank you, Ms. Ruth. I, yeah. I will say I've seen lots of advertisements and, and all on social media and all and in terms of looking for, for um, qualified teachers. So uh, I know you're out there working hard. Yes, we absolutely are. Um, the PR and marketing department has been very supportive in the marketing mm -hmm. efforts, and we have been looking under every rock we can find. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Vice Chairman, that concludes um, Superintendent and Staff Reports. Dr. Mason. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. So the next item on the agenda is um, number five, hearing of any delegations or presentations of any written communications or petitions. And so far, I just have one. Okay. I just have one person, and I'll ask... Um, Ms. Bowers to read the protocol. Okay. Citizens are invited to address the school board on matters of public concern about the school division. Speaker forms are available prior to the start of the meeting. If you wish to address the school board, please complete the form and give it to the clerk. Each individual will have five minutes to speak. All comments shall be directed to the school board. Speakers may not yield their time to another. Speakers should address the school board with decorum on policy issues. Speakers comment on individuals at their own risk of violating confidentiality laws and are defaming the subjects of their comments. Neither the school board, the superintendent, nor the school administration will respond publicly to any comments by speakers about individuals. Presentation of resolutions, declarations, proclamations, manifestos, awards, or other similar documents not originated under the auspices of the school board or administration is prohibited during the public comment period. The audience is asked to be respectful of all speakers. Public comment is the school board's opportunity to listen to the speaker. Since our purpose is to hear from you, the board will not engage in dialogue with the audience or whomever is at the podium. Matters requiring a response will be directed to the superintendent for research and response. The superintendent <clears throat> may report back on such matters at a subsequent business meeting session as appropriate. The school board carefully considers your comments as we decide matters that are brought before us. We appreciate your attendance and your input. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we do have one speaker tonight, uh, and that's Mr. Mark Crump. We we'll ask you to approach the podium. <coughs> and, uh, you can state, clearly state your name and your address. Good evening. My name is Mark Crump. My address is 234 Cove Drive, Hampton, Virginia, 23669. Um, good evening, 
Vice Chair, Dr. Mason, and Dr. Smith, and members of the school board. Um, I just, I, I, I'm just coming, one, to say thank you for a, um, a five-year partnership with the school board. I'm a local State Farm agent, and uh, for the last five years, I've been organizing a school supply drive, and I know that you all have uh, acknowledged me several times, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge you all and thank you all for the, for the partnership. Um, we do have the event coming up this uh, Saturday, August 7th, at the Kroger, located on uh, Mercury Boulevard, 1050 Mercury Boulevard, and uh, we'll be out there collecting school supplies, hoping to be able to provide some additional supplies for the students. We realize that in times like this, uh, students have many, many uh, distractions, and we want to make sure that school supplies are the last thing they have to be distracted by. So um, I just want to say thank you all and invite you all out to come out on Saturday, this Saturday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Hampton Kroger. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is uh, item number six, deliberation. 6.01 and we've already heard the revised 2021-2022 fund 60 reimbursable projects budget are there any questions at this time from board members under deliberation okay hearing none this item will be moved to the action agenda for our next meeting all right, the next item is item number seven, items for action. 7.01, the Virginia Public School Authority Resolution. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been properly stated in second. Uh, any discussion? Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Aponja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Next is item number eight, deliberation first read. And it looks like we'll start with 8.01, revision of school board policy AC, non discrimination. 8.02, Revision of School Board Policy GBA, Equal Opportunity Employer. 8.03, Revision of School Board Policy GBAB, Discriminatory Harassment. 8.04, revision, revision of School Board Policy JB, Equal Educational Opportunities. 8.05, Revision of School Board Policy AD, Philosophy of the Hampton School Board. And 8.06, Revision of School Board Policy GBA REEO Complaint Procedure. And I will stop there because all of those belong to you, Ms. Ruth. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I do have the first several policies. And if it is all right with you, Vice Chair, I am going to ad address the, the first five of them as a block. These are our non discrimination policies and the changes that we are making are the same across the board. There is one different change and I will point that out. Um, all of the policies currently contain language that uh, identifies um, one of the members of a protected class is, is if you have a status as a veteran. We are updating the language across all of the policies to read military status. So it's not just veterans, but also active duty military as well. So that change is across the board. There is, um, for all of the policies, there is also an additional change on page 16 of GBAB, which is our discriminatory harassment and retaliation policy. And uh, in addition to updating the military status language, we have clarified when this policy, uh, or if there's a, a complaint that we receive that is, does not fall under the qualifications for a Title IX investigation, it identifies that we will actually use the procedures that are listed in GBA-R. And so that language has been added. 
And then, and this is not specific to the changes in these non-discrimination policies, but I did want to share with the board, as I'm sure you are aware, House Bill 145 requires all school boards to adopt a policy addressing the treatment of transgender students. Um, and we are required to do that prior to the start of the 2021-2022 school year. After a review of the model policy that was developed by the Virginia Department of Education and in consultation with the Virginia School Board Association and uh, Nancy Reeves, our school board attorney, we believe that our existing non-discrimination policies meet the new legal mandate and therefore you will not see a separate recommendation coming forward from um, the, the policy committee. Um, I do want to stress, however, while we're not recommending a separate policy, we have developed draft guidelines that will provide guidance to our building-based administrators um, and, well, all building-based employees. Our administrators are currently reviewing those draft guidelines and they will be in place and ready for uh, all staff prior to the start of the school year. So I just wanted to share that with you as an FYI, in in case you had questions about that or have heard things from other school boards and, and from VSBA. Just wanted to give you an update as to where we are with that. Um, so that is everything with the those first uh, five non-discrimination policies. The next policy, if, if it is all right with the vice chair that I will move on to is policy AD which is our philosophy of the Hampton School Board. And um, you'll see actually the, the copy that you all have is, is all blue. The entire policy is not new, but we did reorder it. So it was just easier, instead of it being all choppy, blue, red, blue, red, we just made the whole thing blue. Um, what we have done with this particular policy is to make changes that reflect reflect a related legislative change and we have added language to incorporate the lens of equity and culturally responsive practices into this particular uh, philosophical statement. Um, we also have updated the language to ensure that it is consistent with our strategic plan. You'll see it very closely aligns with with our strategic plan, we felt that was important. Um, and I do want to thank Dr. Angela Bird Wright for taking the lead on <coughs> revising this particular policy in her role as our equity leader for the school division. And then the final policy that is on uh, my docket is GBA-R, and that is the policy that I referenced um, back when I was discussing, discussing our discrimination policy or discriminatory harassment policy. And it's a mirror change. We've just added the language to indicate that this is the complaint procedure that we will utilize if there's a discriminatory harassment or retaliation complaint that does not meet Title IX criteria. And that's just to, to provide greater clarification for our employees. And those are all of my policies. All right. Thank you, Ms. Ruth. All right. The next six policies, I guess, are owned by John Eagle, Mr. Eagle, and they are 8.07, Revision of School Board Policy GBBB, Staff Acceptable Use Policy, 8.08, .08, Revision of School Board Policy IIBEA, Student Acceptable Use Policy, 8.09, Revision of School Board Policy GBBC, Staff Electronic Mail, 8.10, Revision of School Board Policy IIBEB, Student Electronic Mail. 8.11, Revision of School Board Policy GBBD, Social Media Policy. And 8.12, Revision of School Board Policy EGAAA, Reproduction of Copyrighted Material. Mr. Eagle. Good evening, <clears throat> Vice Chair Dr. Mason, Dr. Smith, members of the board. Pleasure to be up here uh, in front of you tonight. Um, it's been a couple of years. Um, some new faces on here. It's uh, great to see you all. Um, of course, we review our policies on a uh, frequent basis uh, at a minimum of every two years. 
uh, we put together a policy team between uh, the Department of Information Technology and the Department of Innovation and Professional Learning. And of course, policies also go through the Policy Review Committee. Um, and with your permission, I'll follow um, Ms. Ruth's example and just go through these as a block, see if there's any questions. Uh, starting with GBB, the acceptable use policy. Uh, it, we start off here, uh, most of these changes are just for style and clarity. Um, and uh, so while it looks like there's a lot of red and blue here, um, uh, the most substantive changes I'll be covering and there anything that's very substantive, obviously I will emphasize. Um, we did make a change throughout these documents where it referred to computer resources and we changed to computing resources. We felt that was more appropriate. Um, and of course, uh, the technology lingo, you know, we sort of separated that out in the opening paragraphs of the a AUP and, and provided bullets for those and did that in the instructional side of the house as well. Um, so you can see again uh, where moving down the policy into terms and conditions. Again, we've changed uh, some slight wording. Some of this is also, again, to reflect wording that's used by the VSBA. Um, and uh, again, changing computer to computing um, in several places. Um, moving down to under number three, unacceptable use. There was a, pair, uh, a sentence in there about using resources wastefully, such as file space. You know, 20 years ago, um, you know, computer programmers would take all means necessary to conserve computer space, which is why we had the Y2K problem. You may remember that. We all truncated the year to two digits in order to save space, and that's really just not the problem that it used to be, and so we took that out because it really doesn't apply um, as much anymore. And there's other ways that we cover things like waste, and, uh, uh, wasteful use of resources. So didn't feel that that was really uh, necessary to keep in here any further. Um, you will also notice three bullets added at the end um, in regards to installing software on computer resources um, or updating the operating systems or intentionally interfering with the equipment like unplugging things if you don't know what you're, what you're doing. So we wanted to make sure that we covered those things as well. Um, again, under network etiquette, we just made some style changes to make um, it a little bit more readable, a little bit more clear. Um, and again, you will see the changes uh, from the, the, the term computer resources to computing resources in the next section. So moving on down, um, under number six, security, we did add a provision in regards to student data privacy, as, as especially as it um, pertains to FERPA and COPA. Um, this is something that, you know, obviously we pay an, a, a lot of it, attention to. I work with Ms. Reeves quite frequently on this issue. There's a lot that's evolving. There's consortiums that we're a member of to, that uh, deal with student data privacy. And so we thought it was appropriate to include this in the AUP so that when we are looking at software, that we're making sure that, that these systems are also taking student data privacy seriously. And so we have a, a rubric that we use to evaluate those systems. Uh, moving down, again, under charges, again, just some updated language there, as well as under number nine, Google services. And then finally, we added a paragraph 12 um, that, again, just sort of emphasizes that the equipment that we assign to staff does not belong to them, and they're expected to turn it in when they leave the division. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on, if there's if there are any questions on the AUP for staff, I'll move on to the AUP for um, for instruction. Again, the, the the very first page is very similar to what you just saw with the staff AUP. Uh, just some clarifying language here, putting the techno lingo uh, into bullet format to cover hardware and software and data services and so forth, changing the phrase computer resources to computing resources, um, things like school to division business, again, using the VSBA recommendations. Um, and uh, let's see, the most substantive change in this, actually in most of this was just purely, again, for style and clarity and conforming to VSB recommendations. Okay. So moving on to electronic mail for staff, GBBC. Um, 
we just changed the second bullet when it refers to um, communicating personal or confidential information. Again, we sort of broadened that. It, it originally had said of others. It really doesn't matter whose confidential information it is. We wanted to make sure that we stated that that, that should not be shared. But we did provide an exception, which wasn't there before, because, of course, there are times when we do need to share information through uh, electronic mail, and we want to make sure that proper safeguards are, are taken when that does, in fact, take place. And we have uh, protocols in place to deal with that as well. Okay. And moving on to electronic mail for staff. Again, almost the identical change, except there is no exception. We don't want students ever sharing any confidential information, either about themselves or anybody else for that nature, for that, for that matter. And again, just one style change at the end of uh, that paragraph where we took out uh, on the last paragraph of that policy uh, by the student. I guess the policy team did not feel like that was required. Okay, moving on to social media policy, policy GBBD. Um, again, we updated some of the language in the opening paragraph, just updating the technology, Technolingo, uh, adding Snapchat and TikTok, um, taking out Google Plus. That's really no longer a, a prominent platform, a social media platform. Changing, uh, taking out online letters to the editor towards a more generic uh, comment form and taking out chat rooms, which again is sort of dated, and just referring to messaging apps instead. Uh, moving down, a more substantive change, uh, the second bullet uh, on the first page refers to employees not linking to Hampton City Schools website or post any school division material on a social media site without written permission. Uh, both of our teams felt that that was uh, just not uh, in keeping with the times, um, it's almost impossible to enforce, somewhat uh, even antagonistic, um, one, might, one might say, but uh, you know, there's, there's other ways that, again, if, if people are kind of stepping out of bounds when it comes to social media, that we can cover that in other policies. It's not so much a technology policy as a behavioral issue uh, when it comes to those kinds of posts. Um, we also made a change to the first bullet on the second page, um, the uh, registration of sites, uh, we referred to the Department of Information Technology, changed that to the Department of Public Relations and Marketing. Uh, and I think that was, yes, that was the only other change that we made in that policy. All righty, and I believe the last one is policy EGAAA, reproduction of copyrighted materials. And again, the only change in this policy was to change from uh, the Director of Information Literacy. Of course, that department has changed the name now to Innovation and Professional Learning. So we made that change accordingly. All right. Any questions? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. And our last two policies under the first read, 8.13. Revision of School Board Policy JED, Attendance Policy, and 8.14, Revision of School Board Policy KK, Visitors to the School. And Ms. Hatcher? Yes, mm -hmm. I'm here tonight to present these two policies and explain the changes, but I do want to give Ms. Hardy, uh, Dr. Hardy, credit for researching this and getting these updates to us. So with the first policy, you'll see some changes really reflecting the VSBA policy update that was happening in May. And you also see some updates to our division truancy and our chronic absentee protocols. And we do review this frequently um, to help because it aligns with the rights and responsibility handbook that you all have approved. Uh, the next policy also is an update. Uh, it is due for review and it aligns to the VSBA update. It does reflect some current language for us in regards to our health mitigation strategies. So you will see some blue changes on that. All right. Thank you very much. And these items will be moved to the deliberation agenda for our next meeting. And that brings us to item number nine, information. 9.01, next meetings. Uh, this school board will meet on August the 18th, starting with a closed session at 5.30 p.m. to discuss the school superintendent's uh, contract, and that meeting will be at the Rupert Sargent Building at 1 Franklin Street, with the general board meeting starting at 
in the same location. Okay, 9.02, information. Dr. Smith. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, one, uh, to certainly say um, in, in her absence to uh, Delegate Mugler, my appreciation uh, for uh, the, the resolution, but to, to also acknowledge our staff, um, the board members, members of the division leadership team, our entire administrative uh, team, and teachers, students, and families, we share this journey together. So thank you uh, so very much. I also want to highlight in particular that um, uh, we had the pleasure of uh, a uh, leadership summit uh, the last three days on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And I want to commend the staff for doing an exceptional job uh, in setting the landscape for the opening of uh, the 2021-2022 school year. And uh, in addition to that, uh, I would like to highlight that on today we had the pleasure of recognizing 24 rising sophomores at uh, Thomas Nelson Community College. Uh, this is the first time they were the inaugural class for us in terms of earning that college credit uh, before entering into their official sophomore year. Uh, and so we appreciate the collaboration with uh, President Brandon there and uh, thank Dr. Haynes and others for their leadership. I'd like to, if I may, just ask Dr. Haynes to come to the podium and just briefly highlight that for us. Uh, if we can do that. Dr. Haynes. He's, he's going to say, well, well, Dr. Smith said it all. Uh, so. <laughs> Good evening, Vice Chair Dr. Mason, members of the board, Dr. Smith. We had a remarkable event that took place this evening, or this latter part of this afternoon, where 24 rising sophomores started taking a college course mm -hmm. about five or six weeks ago, and all 24 of them successfully completed the program as well. Earning those three college credits, yes, that was amazing. <laughs> Earning those three college credits and also the credits in high school, so that dual credit piece worked mm -hmm. certainly in their favor. They were, there was full representation from all four high schools. So we had students from Phoebus, Hampton, Bethel, and Kikatan take advantage of that. Parents attended the ceremony this evening in support of it. Mm -hmm. And they were all awed at the fact that not only they got the three college credits, but it was also a cost saving, savings piece for them because it was roughly what? About $500 for the class that they did not have to pay. Mm -hmm. Did not have to pay for the class, nor the books, materials. We provided the transportation, and it's mm. the first time in history that we've been afforded the opportunity to allow rising sophomores take take college courses, take a college course. Awesome. Uh, we also had a great partnership. It was something that was the brainchild of Dr. Smith and Dr. Brandon, the president at Thomas Nelson. They came up with the idea and concept, and uh, collectively it was put together with. Um, great ideas and thought processes with Dr. Kate Maxlow, the Director of Innovation and Professional Learning, Veronica Hurd, Director of the Academies of Hampton, uh, Ms. Amber Brown was instrumental in that as well. And then I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, the work that was put behind the scenes logistically with Darren Wills in the Transportation right. Department. But it was something remarkable to witness in the excitement that they had and just knowing that they showed up every single day. The attendance was perfect as well. but it was an event we hope to replicate uh, in the future, and we have sort of kind of a path to do so, and having them serve as the anchor for it, and hopefully the ambassadors moving forward. Thank you. Great job, Dr. Uh, uh, Haynes, and, uh, and thank you for your leadership in that regard as well. Uh, uh, he really provided division leadership um, uh, in terms of helping to lead that effort. And so uh, the member on the division leadership team who uh, really pulled individuals together and, and monitored all the logistics in terms of moving forward. And so uh, we appreciate that. Thank you uh, so very much, uh, Vice Chairman, for the opportunity. That, that concludes my remarks.
Okay. Vice Chairman, I have one quick question yes. for Dr. Smith as mm -hmm. it relates to the ACE Academy, and Dr. May Haynes may be able to also answer this question. Um, so do we have a, a number, or do we know the number of students enrolled in the ACE Academy this school year so far? I can certainly get those numbers uh, to you. I don't have them with me this evening, but um, that would we, be great to know. we do know that uh, last year uh, for the class of 2021, we had uh, was 26 mm -hmm. young people who graduated with an associate degree, and uh, we expect those numbers to continue uh, to increase as a school division as we go forward, but we'll get those numbers to you. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you. Okay. All, right. All right. Any information from board members? I'd just like to remind everybody about the Stuff the Bus event this weekend. Uh, uh, Mr. Crump of State Farm spoke on that earlier, and so we will be out there um, on Saturday at the Kroger on Mercury Boulevard. So everyone come out and, and support the Stuff the, e Stuff the Bus event. All right? That's a tongue twister for me. All right? And um, student rep, Tamia, anything from you? Uh, I'm not sure if the young woman is still here who was working to help with COVID safety, but I really do appreciate her. I know that the Hampton High Marching Band has just started up, and it's wonderful to be able to be in a safe environment and be able to see our peers again. This is, for the first time, a lot of these children seeing each other, and we do definitely have a lot of new faces for the incoming freshmen. So I just want to say thank you for helping to keep us safe. All right, all right. Well, with nothing else, that brings us to item 10, adjournment. So I declare this meeting adjourned.